Um, first of all, I'd like to thank you for organizing this, and I've followed uh, Balfour Project uh, from afar for quite some time. Um, Jerusalem is not in the headlines, and that's good. Um, eyes are riveted on Gaza, where they belong, um, north, um, which is Hezbollah, and the events in the West Bank. But Jerusalem is not burning. And that's not a trivial statement. I think it surprised everybody. Um, it certainly surprised me uh, that there has been relative calm in the city since the outbreak of the war. Um, it may not last, but I want to examine that a little bit. Traditionally, there's a hidden bond and affinity between the residents of Jerusalem and the residents of East Jerusalem and the residents in Gaza uh, for all sorts of reasons. Um, when there's violence um, on, in, between Israel and Gaza, um, there's a tendency for it to spread uh, beyond. It's not only an issue of uh, Gaza and Israel. And frequently there will be protests and clashes here in Jerusalem as a result of events in Gaza. Uh, part of it is due to the fact that Gaza perhaps is the most devout Palestinian constituency, and they're the ones who will never see a lot. I think that creates something special. We could witness that in 2021, May 2021, where the war was triggered by events in Jerusalem, and there were two events. One, the erosion of the status quo at Alexa, um, which was tinkering with explosives and still happening. And the other was the prospect of large scale displacement in Sheikh Jarrah, which has been suspended for the, me for the, the in the meantime. Uh, but those two events were the immediate detonators of this conflict. Uh, that didn't happen this time. Um, the situation's um, not better in Jerusalem, but it didn't happen. Uh, and the question is why? Well, on the first day of the war, I got reports from Palestinian colleagues that our neighborhoods are being blocked. And I couldn't get a straight answer from anybody, so I went out and looked at things. And the police had indeed placed concrete blocks at the entrances and exits to the Palestinian neighborhoods in East Jerusalem. They were never used. Uh, they were anticipating, and it didn't happen. Um, the question why, you know, don't forget I'm an Israeli. I based myself almost exclusively on my Palestinian colleagues and those whom I rely on. I don't dare speak on behalf of the Palestinians. I'm an observer. One of the first notable things uh, in Jerusalem, that the, the streets were empty, both Jerusalem East and West. Um, people, I don't think it was necessarily fear, although it was an element of that, but people with, were withdrawing into themselves, into their familiar, into their own communities. Uh, people were not going to work. And that was especially the case in East Jerusalem. And to a certain extent, remains to be the, the case. Um, almost 40,000 Palestinians from East Jerusalem, and it's a population of 400,000, work in West Jerusalem or in Israel proper. Uh, initially, they stayed away from work. They were cautious and apprehensive of the workplace, and there were tensions. It was not baseless. But that gradually has led up. What has not led up is the devastating impact of this war on uh, the economy of East Jerusalem, because so much of it is based on tourism, uh, and there is there are zero tourists, zero tourists, uh, and that spreads. So the situation uh, in Jerusalem started out being challenged by way too high poverty levels. That has increased significantly. I don't know, perhaps some of you have experienced this. When, when my wife and I would be in the middle of a crisis that had nothing to do with the kids uh, and we're handling the crisis, the kids knew to shut up. 
this is not the time to mess with your parents. And they sort of moved aside. I think that's somewhat the case in uh, East Jerusalem from what I'm hearing from my friends. Um, this is not the time for the third intifada, is the general sentiment. Again, that can change rather quickly, but until now, that has been the case. What is happening in East Jerusalem? Are there extraordinary developments? And I would say there are a number. Um, one, um, Jerusalem, East Jerusalem, de facto, is under something very reminiscent of martial law. That's not an accident. In 2021, the commander of the police department said, I attribute a lion's share to the outbreak of violence in this round to Itamar Benvir, the rabble rouser, who was in Sheikh Jarrah causing trouble. Uh, today, Itamar Benvir is the minister of internal security, clinical racist, and he's the commander of the same police chief who said that of him. Um, in general, over the last year, the uh, police has become more violent and less tolerant of freedom of expression. Um, but it's particularly the case in East Jerusalem, and now there is the inspiration of the minister and a war. Uh, so there are summary arrests, often on the street, sometimes in the middle of the night. Um, initially, there were people being arrested who were associated with Al-Aqsa without any political affiliation, uh, plucked, literally plucked off the street. Um, a very disturbing development. You know, you have to carry uh, an ID in Israel, everybody. And when requested by an authority, you have to present it. Um, in my 50 years living here, that's happened to me three times. Um, every Palestinian in East Jerusalem undergoes that several times a year. Uh, it's not uncommon. It's one of the low-key abuses of occupation. Uh, but they're not doing that now. They're saying, give me your cell phone. And if the cell phone's locked, open it. And if you don't, you're gonna, it's going to be smashed under the boot of a policeman. Uh, and they will go in and check your feeds, your WhatsApp, your Facebook, your photographs. Now, there are cases of criminal language all over the world um, on social media. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about taking people's most private things and examining it. Uh, it is not legal. They need a search warrant and they don't get a search warrant. Um, there have been dozens of arrests on this and not one indictment. In other words, this is part of the um, endemic harassment of everyday life, um, which is worse than it was in the past. There have been very few clashes between uh, Palestinians and youth or otherwise and the police, but it does not reflect the level of tension. The level of tension is very high. Now, I want to observe something, and I'm doing it with caution because it lends itself to caricature, but something that I noticed. The Palestinian citizens of Israel have not been protesting. I mean, there's a great deal of consternation and concern and worry, and, and you know, Ahmed Tibi lost three of his family members in Gaza um, and is in mourning. Um, but the polls indicate um, that the Palestinian citizens of Israel identify more with Israeli society today than at any level in the past. And there are, no, again, these are of limited use, but it's a phenomenon. And there's volunteer work, civil society, and things of that nature. 
among the Palestinians in East Jerusalem, I have to rely on friends um, who monitor these things. And they've told me that the discussions, not public, internal discussions among Palestinian youth in social media, Facebook, etc., cetera, uh, WhatsApp is overwhelming sympathy with Hamas. Only Hamas was able to put us back on the table. Uh, sympathy does not equal support. Uh, people have not converted their political beef beliefs in the direction of Hamas, but clearly the sympathy is there. Um, zero solidarity or identification with Israel. Um, on the question of the events of October 7th, uh, some of the people who are speaking are expressing distress and dissatisfaction with uh, the, the violence and the, the, that took place, and we all know what it is. Uh, but there are others who have bought into uh, massacre denial, which I know is not, you know, it doesn't belong to the Palestinians of East Jerusalem, but it is a phenomenon that never happened. It did. We have to deal with it. It did. Um, two generations ago, the Palestinian citizens of Israel and the Palestinian uh, um, residents of East Jerusalem were brothers and sisters living together. Yet one has moved in a direction of solidarity with Israel. By the way, this is not condoning Israeli actions. It's a social um, uh, identification. While the Palestinians, no solidarity. I think that that is a very compelling and interesting view of what occupation is. Um, Israel democracy as flawed as it is, and I know how flawed it is, and I know it's not a democracy in the West Bank, has, in spite of all of the crises, fared pretty well. Israeli occupation, including the occupation of East Jerusalem, is a failure. Now, have there been any De developments where the government is taking advantage of the situation um, to do things that they wouldn't do otherwise. Um, I think not. Um, I think there are a couple of exceptions. Um, the crisis and takeover attempt in the Armenian quarter, which is extremely dangerous, and extremely consequential and warrants close monitoring and help. I think it was uh, there was a, an attempt to take over because people were so riveted and looking elsewhere in Gaza. Um, but the other events have been going on as usual. Now that may sound good, it's not, because the first part of the year before the war, there was unprecedented settlement development. It's not slowing down. The day after the war, there was to be a planning committee meeting um, on a very controversial settlement, Kidmat um, in the middle of Abu Dis. And the members of the committee asked the chairperson, put it off. I mean, we're, we're reeling. We, we don't know, you know, we have loved ones. We don't know where they are. She said, no. Um, I don't think she was told to say no. But I think the zeitgeist is, when it comes to helping the settlers, it is business as usual. Um, the settlements that are being promoted now, and they're being promoted daily, uh, are particularly damaging. Uh, I can single out a couple of them. One is Kidmatsio, which, if built, uh, will be the largest settlement enclave in East Jerusalem, and it's being ramrodded, fast-tracked through uh, the committees, um, would not happen without directions from the political echelon. Mm -hmm. And then something new has happened, which I haven't even put into writing yet, but I will shortly. The Israeli government made a decision in 1967, we will not um, 
build Israeli neighborhoods in the midst of Palestinian neighborhoods. Menachem Baker opposed that. We have we've, we've kept that policy. Now, I know all of the exceptions. Uh, the settlement enclaves, which are not directly government, they're proxies of government. So it's false innocence for my part to say it's never been done. But it was always at a distance. We now have currently two plans initiated directly by the government of Israel. One in Shafafat, which is a section of Beit Zafafa. I think it's 20 or 25 stories, perfect for a Palestinian village. Um, and it was approved. Um, uh, we're awaiting uh, you know, statutory approval. And the second one uh, in Umlisun, uh, which is uh, part of Jabal Mukaber. All of this backed by the uh, settler organizations. This is not the grand scheme of Israel to encircle Jerusalem. This is the, involving the transformation of Jerusalem. The target of many of these things are the visual basin around the old city, which is being encircled by settlement and settlement related activities. And that does continue a, a, a pace. Final point before I open it to questions. What about Alexa? Um, everybody's fear was that um, the war in Gaza would trigger, trigger clashes um, at Alexa, particularly volatile on Fridays, during Friday services. Um, and that hasn't happened. I'm not telling you it's not going to happen two days from now, but it hasn't happened. Um, and there are a number of reasons, and not all of them are good reasons. Uh, one is there's a closure. Hundreds of thousands of Palestinians who normally would have access Friday prayers at Alexa are not allowed into the city. Uh, so the numbers have gone down. The Palestinian citizens of Israel in 2021 rallied around Al-Aqsa. It was the flashpoint of the conflagration of this conflict. Um, this time, the leadership, both political and religious, have told uh, their constituencies, stay away. So on Fridays, if you've ever stood on Mount of Olives and looked towards St. Stephen's Gate, you would see a kilometer of buses uh, blocking the street. They were buses from the Galilee of Palestinian citizens, and they were buses from the Negev, which was uh, largely Bedouin. No buses. So another reason the numbers are way down. Third reason the numbers are way down is that the police are limiting um, access during prayers to people aged 45 and above. And the closure of Al-Aqsa to people younger than 45 is not at the gate of um, um, Haram al-Sharif, it's further away in, in Sheikh Jarrah for Wadi Joes. So there are clashes, but the clashes are not near Al-Aqsa, uh, but on the way to Al-Aqsa, and it has been pretty much contained. Um, for reasons I have no idea, but this is what my friends are telling me, that the sermons, um, uh, during Friday prayers have been very vocal uh, and very strong um, in condemning Israel and in protesting uh, what is happening in Gaza. They were not incitement and there was little tension. Now on the police side, it's different. I told you that the Jerusalem police has the trappings of a private militia directed by Ben Gvir. Not the case here. Um, the police is more restrained. Now, again, this is not saying they're doing great. They're not as bad. Uh, the access to those who are allowed is fairly smooth. Uh, there's more restraint. Um, there's been little or no violence or clashes with the police. Um, 
I understand one thing from this, and that is, um, I'm pretty convinced that this is right. I have no verification. There's a deal between Netanyahu and Ben Gvir. You're staying away from Al-Aqsa. Too dangerous. Whatever else you want to do in Jerusalem, fine. So you basically have two polices. And I, I believe that what is happening uh, at uh, Al-Aqsa is a directive coming from the prime minister's office. I want to note something else, which is very interesting, that the number of Jewish visitors to the Mount are also way down, which is remarkable because the ideological messianic Temple Mount movements have been beating the drums, but the numbers are down. More importantly, the police would allow the Jewish visitors uh, to violate the status quo, you know, prayer, you know, triumphalism, also. they have been holding the, um, those uh, from the temple moving, going to the mount on a very short lease. They're in, you know, the, the, the minute something like that happens, they're escorted off the mountain. So all of that has created somewhat of a temporary equilibrium. I'll come back to that in, in, in one moment. There was one serious event uh, which didn't happen, but could have happened. Um, uh, during December, I think it was, um, the uh, last night of Hanukkah, the Temple Mount movements called for a mass march um, from the 67 border through Damascus Gate and ending up going through Elwad Street, ending up at the Western Wall. But that's with a wink and a nod. This is all about Al-Aqsa. And the reports, which were credible and substantiated, was that the police had given the green light for this. That's not policy. That's pyromania. Um, on Jerusalem Day, we have witnessed thousands of people of this ilk marauding through the Muslim quarter with impunity shouting death to the Arabs. And nobody in Israel, nobody in the government, uh, with the mayor, mayor's office, condemning it. Um, and we were cautioning people, this is precisely the kind of thing that can make Jerusalem detonate. But it was going to happen. Um, and um, again, I was receiving reports from the field live there are only about 200, 300 people um, and another 100 observers. Not a big turnout. And they're starting to march. But the police aren't letting them go in the direction of Damascus Gate. They're letting them as far as Newgate, and they're not even letting them in Newgate. The organizers have suggested, okay, we'll go through Jaffa Gate. No, the police boxed them in. It didn't happen. It was not an event. And by the way, Ben Gvir did not condemn the containment of this march, basically prohibition of this march, even though it was his own friends and colleagues who were carrying it out and carrying it out in his spirit. Um, I can say two things with authority and one which is a bit of a guess. Um, the approval of this march uh, and the cancellation of the march by the police, neither of these could have taken place without the knowledge and consent of Netanyahu. And it is our experience that this is the least engageable government in the history of Israel, that um, Netanyahu listens to his extreme coalition partners far more than he does to member states of the EU, the UK, or the United States. But in this case, um, he apparently responded. The conjecture is, um, I've been told that two hours before the march, President Biden had a conversation with Netanyahu. Now, if I had a suspicious mind, I would assume that was one of the issues that was there. Uh, it can't be built upon. All of these things can change. I mean, it's a tinderbox, but there's one thing that is absolutely certain. And that is that in the beginning of March, 
uh, Ramadan. And Ramadan will transform the conflict that exists into a very local Jerusalem issue. And it will be pressured by the Temple Mount movements and Ben Gvir threatening to take down the coalition if he doesn't. We're, we're watching a train wreck in slow motion. Um, and preparation for uh, um, Ramadan is absolutely essential. Uh, there have to be quiet talks, uh, clear guidelines of do's and don'ts. We know what causes violence to erupt at Al-Aqsa. We know who the provocateurs are, and we know that the status quo has been compromised, including during Ramadan. So we now have a few weeks um, to try and um, use trends in the international community. And by the way, especially in the Arab world, uh, Jordan, of course, has its historical role as custodian and is involved. And um, e Egypt has expressed concerns, but we, in one of my discussions with uh, friend, people from the Gulf, one of them sort of laughed at me and said, yeah, but your prime minister doesn't listen to you, does he? I said, yeah, my prime minister doesn't listen to a word I say, but he listens to you. And this is an Arab cause, Ramadan and Laksa, it is a Muslim cause. You have equity. There's nobody can say, this is none of your business. And I would use whatever uh, levers of power as there may be, um, uh, to try and defuse a potentially very tense situation. That's basically it. Thank you so much, Danny, for that. That was absolutely fascinating. And um, we've got a whole bunch of questions coming through. So we're going to try to get through as many as we can. This one, I think it'll be a quick one, because um, I think even I know the answer uh, from David Dunnett. Um, How do the police check the WhatsApp uh, messages when they are in Arabic? There are a lot of Arabic Basically. speaking policemen, uh, Good. some Jewish and um, others Druze, but, uh, and the Arabic speaking policemen are those generally detailed to Jerusalem. Right. Um, then we've got from Bettina Marx, and this question came up from a few different people, actually. Can you please refer to what's happening in the Armenian quarter? And is this related to the situation in Gaza? Well, um, I have to define my role. I am working actively with the Armenian community. Uh, but I'm not their legal representative. So what I'm telling you is from my perspective and not theirs, uh, the good part. Um, seven months ago, a couple of guys in their 20s called me and asked me to come over. They were seeing things and they were concerned about things. And what they were seeing was an attempt by settlers to take over 15% of the uh, Armenian quarter. Today, those two guys have built a movement which is has a global reach and received attention and received attention during a war, which makes me a little bit more optimistic. I have to tell you, it's an inspiration. It's real inspiration. Um, there was a deal um, where the Armenian patriarch purportedly leased uh, property, prime property of the Armenian quarter to an Israeli corporation, uh, which nobody knew anything about. It had no financial banking, no, nobody knew the people involved. This was done without the knowledge and consent of the community. Uh, from day one, I said, this is the settlers. And uh, there's no way that the patriarch doesn't know about this. Now we've had precedent along those lines, uh, but they haven't arrived at that conclusion. They're, they're, they think there were mistakes made. Um, they have excellent legal representation, uh, but they're confronting settlers. I'm convinced I will be able to establish over time 
that this is uh, a move initiated by a very specific settler organization in East Jerusalem. Uh, they could not do it without the knowledge and consent of the government of Israel. I know which agency in the government of Israel, given time, I'll find out. I've been doing this long enough. They won't say that, and they're correct. But, but regardless, they are being challenged by settlers because these are Israeli developers beyond the green line, regardless. Um, this came to a head not only because it was revealed, but because the developers used this as an opportunity to literally take over property, a parking area, which I'll talk about in a second. Uh, and they brought in violent thugs to take it over with uh, automatic weapons uh, in the first time, chains, clubs, etc. Many of them were recruited from among the Palestinians in East Jerusalem, young guys, and the minute they saw who they were supposed to be dealing with and what they're supposed to be doing, they all went home. They weren't going to involve themselves. But the settlers remained. Um, uh, there have been a few rounds like this. There was a an additional uh, um, assault two weeks ago, I believe, two weeks ago today. And this time um, they brought in Palestinian citizens of Israel from villages in the north. They're extremely brave, these guys. They have built the community. They're there 24-7. Um, they are now wired internationally. The danger is far from over, but they they really could use support. Now, I want to just two words about the Armenian community. Their roots in Jerusalem go back to the fourth century. Uh, and uh, many of the people can either trace their roots to those families or those who are, uh, arrived in the early 20th century after uh, the Armenian Holocaust. Uh, it's a challenged community. It's very small. It's a couple thousand people. Uh, and they are valiantly trying to maintain the integrity of the community and the presence here. I can tell you with authority, uh, this is a community that is neither Palestinian nor Israeli, but they're fine with both. And they're an important cultural part of Jerusalem. Jerusalem would not be Jerusalem were it not for the Armenians. Um, and many Palestinians in East Jerusalem sympathize this for personal reasons, because they have undergone this fear and attempt at displacement that the Armenians are now undergoing now. Thank you so much. We had, like I said, a few people asking about that. Um, one of them was also Harry Hagopian, who also asks um, a question I'm super fascinated to hear your take on. What mm -hmm. is your reaction to the political tattle that PM Netanyahu is a goner once the Gaza war stops, hence the unabated war? Um, I said from the beginning, perhaps a bit earlier, that Netanyahu politically is a walking dead man because he has lost the confidence of all of the elites of Israel. And it doesn't matter how you define elites. You know, elite can be the, you know, the best practice in the country, whatever. Um, and he is held afloat by uh, a coterie of um, kind of Trumpian elves, you know, people who are a yes man and, and a base. He has a base, but it's not a, a, a majority. Uh, at the moment, he's holding Israel hostage. Uh, most of Israel want to be rid of him and do not rely on the way he's conducting the war. Um, I cannot see how he will survive politically. Uh, the question is, how long will it take and how much damage will Netanyahu do on the way out? There is no way of knowing who or what will replace him, but the end of the Netanyahu era is an opportunity to reshape things. The Israeli society reinvented itself twice over the last year. 
once in stopping a judicial coup successfully. And the second time, when the war broke out, the government didn't function. It turned nothing. And it turned out that Netanyahu had hollowed out all of the organs of government. So citizens are doing what the government should be doing. Today, the atmosphere is we have to remake Israel. We have to reinvent Israel. We have to refound Israel. And there'll be leaders and you won't know their names. And I think that's good. Um, occupation initially figured not at all. That has changed and has been inserted into the discourse more frequently. And many people see the war in Gaza as the result of a failure to engage Palestinians willing to engage. Um, and because of occupation and that the government was described by sort of a, a lowbrow commentator, footballer, this is a war between the state of Israel and the state of Judea and Samaria. Now, I'm not telling you this is good. I'm not telling you it's easy, but everybody, you know, automatically concludes um, Israel is going to take a sharp move to the right. I don't believe that's going to happen. But I do think you're going to face two peoples who have been deeply traumatized. Uh, Israelis are in a state of trauma, and certainly, you know, I can't imagine what the people in Gaza are enduring. And the fears of both sides will have to be addressed. Um, but um, we're approaching the end of the Netanyahu era. It doesn't solve anything. It creates opportunities. Thank you so much for that. Um, just looking at who's attending, we had Matthew Teller, the author on the biography of Jerusalem, and Avi Schleim is here. Hi, Avi. Uh, we've got a few MPs, so really happy with the attendance and quite a few comments, including one from Matthew Teller about how fascinating this talk has been, and one recently from Heather Formaini, another one of our regular listeners who also says this is so fascinating. So any comments that you want me to pass on to Daniel, please do pop in the chat box and um, I will pass them on to him. Um, I agree. This has been fascinating. We've got a question from Andrew Whitley, who's the chair of the Balfour Project. Mm -hmm. um, he says, please elaborate on why there have been no protests or demos by Palestinian Israelis over the events in Gaza. Are they feeling intimidated? The silence is striking. There is definitely apprehension. Uh, both Israelis and Palestinians were traumatized by the intercommunal violence within mixed Palestinian Israeli and Israeli, Jewish Israeli cities. It was ugly, it was troubling. Um, and what the Palestinians in East Jerusalem are feeling from the Israeli police, um, the Palestinian citizens of Israel are clearly feeling that as well. But I don't think that that's uh, uh, completely the deterrent. Um, there is a sense that the attack was not only on the Jews in Israel, it was an attack on all of Israel, all Israelis. And there were uh, quite a number of young Palestinian citizens of Israel, but also Palestinians from East Jerusalem who were killed. Uh, and I think it's in a manifestation of the complex identities. You know, people have more than one identity in one soul. It's not a contradiction. Uh, and it's a work in progress. But I think that there is a sense, and I think that the, the nature of October 6th, the massacre, was just so appalling. Uh, they sided with Israelis. By the way, this does not mean their support of Israeli policies, or they're not deeply traumatized by what's happening in Gaza. But it's it's worth noting. I'm not making this up. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> got so many questions coming in. I'm really sorry, everyone. We won't be able to get through all of them. I'm trying to make sure that I cover at least every theme that's being brought up. Um, we've got one from Morning Sh Maureen Shi. Um, I don't know if I've said that right. I'm so sorry. Um, are Christian leaders in Jerusalem too intimidated by Israeli government to speak out? Would it help if they did, or are they discounted as an evangelicals? Um, that is a question. This is a subject 
for another session or maybe more than one. Because this, the, the issue of the Christians in Jerusalem isn't only about the Christians, it's about all of us. What has been happening in recent years that the conflict in Jerusalem has been driven by religious pyromaniacs who have also dominated the discourse. In Israeli, in Israel, it's the Temple Mount movement and the biblically motivated settlers in Sheikh Jarrah and Silwan among um, uh, Muslims that are extreme elements in political Islam who seek a religious conflict for their own reasons. And then there are the evangelical Christians in the United States uh, who make the settlers in the Brotherhood look tame. I mean, we are you know, uh, major actors in their anticipated um, end of days. Um, the Christian communities of Jerusalem have been marginalized. There is very little uh, animated, active hatred towards Christianity or Christian institutions, but it is dismissal. Uh, Jerusalem is ours, get used to it. And the churches are very much feeling uh, blows, serious blows, to the integrity of their communities, to the integrity of the holy sites. Um, and the government is, again, dismissing it. This is a subject that is receiving a lot of attention uh, at highest levels, but has not been tra transformed into action. Uh, but this is something that the White House, the major capitals in Europe, the Pope and Jordanians are, are aware of. It's a specific. There is a plan being carried out to encircle the old city, the historic, religious, and cultural core of Jerusalem with settlement and settlement-related activities. Um, this is not directly the source of the hate crimes against Christian clerics, but there's something of a connection. There have been um, spitting on Christian clerics for many years, but it was located to one area on Mount Zion. It happened half a dozen times a year. Disgusting, terrible, but it wasn't a large phenomenon. Since the formation of this new government, it has become more so, uh, especially to the Armenians, because the route that they take, I made a map of where Christian clergy are attacked, where you have biblically motivated settlers, that's where you have the attacks. There's a clear correlation. So when the needle moves, it moves for everybody. Um, the heads of churches are in a very difficult situation, partially, partially because of vulnerability. It exists. It would be foolish not to acknowledge it. But partially, this is not interfaith. This is not shucks kumbaya off into the sunset. This is hardcore geopolitics. And that it's not what they're trained for. They're trained to deal with other things. Uh, but there are members of the, uh, heads of churches who are a powerful voice, an authentic voice. And this is now being picked up by the religious movements globally and anybody who can assist. I recently met with the Archbishop of Canterbury and yesterday with some of his emissaries. Um, one of the day after things that can be done regardless, regardless, there is absolute an imperative to secure the religious, historical, and cultural integrity of Jerusalem, the viability of all of its communities, and the inviolability of sacred space. All of that has been compromised in recent years, and regardless where we go from here, uh, that's one of the places that we should start. Thank you for that. Um, we've had quite a few questions about um, the general opinion of Israelis, um, but I'm going to take one from Vera Lustig. Uh, here in the UK, many people are agitating for proportional representation in elections, but Israel has some kind of proportional rep representation, yet has an extreme right wing and religious coalition. Does this reflect the will and the opinion of the majority of Israelis? I'm out of my element here. So I'm just another lay person, but the electoral system in Israel is proportional because we are a fragmented society in more ways than you could imagine. And if we were to have just a two-party rule, 
um, uh, the minorities, ultra-Orthodox, they're clearly a group. Palestinian citizens of Israel are not one group. They're several groups, and all of them legitimate. Um, uh, there is the ideological religious right, you know, and so on. So it creates an unwieldy government, but is representative of the public. But being representative of the public means that the 64 members of Knesset now can radically transform the country and hold the rest of the country as, um, as hostage. Majority rule has, uh, has its benefits. I dare not comment on what is best for the UK. Get through. Muted, sorry. Gone, Hello, <laughs> muted. <laughs> Very 2020 of me. Um, a question from Anne Marie Galen. Is it possible that internal opposition can play a key role in ending or reducing the violence against citizens in Gaza? Or is it only possible by pressure from the US or other countries? It is clearly, um, um, it's very clear today that the internal pressure uh, is, is going to be consequential and perhaps decisive. Now, I am by no means making light. I think that the international attention that this is receiving and the way it is being expressed is clearly essential. But um, I think that most of the people in Israel today favor, say, favor a ceasefire or at least one of these humanitarian pauses. There is wider uh, shock at what has happened to Gaza than people would believe. I don't report it to know what the proportions are. It's clearly not a majority. Um, but the general perception of the public is there are two goals to this war. One, to re return the hostages, and the other, to incapacitate Hamas. Some will say wipe it out, whatever. There are variations of this. It is clear that Netanyahu has decided to prefer the latter. M most of the country wants the former. Most of the country, I believe, would say, get the hostages home regardless of the price. Um, this is not a kidnapping. This is a major breach between the government of Israel and the people of Israel in the fundamental uh, task of every government, and that's to protect its citizens. We're talking about hundreds of people. Um, that debate apparently filtered in to the cabinet last night and is not uh, only being expressed publicly, but within the government. That in no way um, means that the international attention and engagement by governments, uh, we will not convalesce Israel as a society without being held accountable. We have been given too many passes for too long. And um, for the first time in a long time, we're going to sweat in order to get international support. And I, as an Israeli, am very much, very pleased about that. So now's my time to uh, get my cap in hand and um, ask everyone make an appeal. As you know, these webinars are free and as are most of our events. <clears throat> we have a few paid ones, um, but most of these, well, these webinar series is free. And then um, we have a bunch of other events that we think are very affordable. Um, but if you would like to support our work, please consider a donation. I've popped the link in our chat box or you can find them on our website um, under the donate button. Um, better yet, if you would like to consider becoming a friend of the Balfour Project, you can do so by signing up for any amount of regular donations, either by month or by year, and you will become a friend of the Balfour Project, uh, which means that you will get discounts on our paid events. Uh, some of them will be free. And you also have access to our sort of quarterly-ish uh, friends meetings where you can have access to some key people within the Balfour Project so that we can get feedback from you um, about what you think, how you think we're doing, what we think, what you think we should be doing, et cetera, et cetera. So do consider that. Again, the link is in the chat box. Um, I'm now going to give you your final question um, because I could talk to you all evening and 
there's more than enough questions, but I know you're very uh, busy. Um, so I will ask you, basically, we've had a couple of questions about the ICJ and international law. So um, one of the questions is, um, uh, what are the views of Israeli international lawyers on the legality of the force employed by the IDF in Gaza? Mm -hmm. And then someone else asking about your views on the case against Israel at the ICJ. Mm -hmm. I'm really disturbed that we've ended up at the ICJ because I know we didn't get there by accident. I think it's a an indication also of the transformations in Israeli society. I welcome engagement of Israel, accountability, and consequences. It's unhealthy. It was bad for us as a society. Uh, international law is not going to solve this conflict, but any forward movement requires respect for international law, and that's required. Um, the international legal profession in Israel is not representative of Israeli society, and clearly there is a range. If I were to have to um, caricature it by saying there's a good deal of recognition that there are major questions to be asked about um, the nature of Israel's response, disproportionately. I mean, um, it, it, most Israelis don't know because it's not shown on television just how devastating it is. And, and we have insensitized ourselves. And um, there are those who say that there is a case to be made. Um, not all. Some would say, well, we have our Supreme Court. We have our, our own Barak. We have um, the military tribunals. Uh, on occasion, they weigh in more often than not, they have been enablers of occupation. So uh, am I um, you know, satisfied with the claim any soldier who did anything wrong will be held accountable? I've been following this for years. That's not what happens. And I think it's important that we know that the risk of uh, soldiers and injuries uh, appearing before the International Criminal Court will make us come to our senses. There is a very wide consensus among um, Israeli professional um, legal minds that the case uh, for genocide does not hold. Uh, that uh, whatever that, you know, there is the morality of the combat, how it was conducted, the proportionality, and it could be devastating, and it certainly could be war crimes, and any number of them. But genocide requires the objective of wiping out a people. I do not believe that to be the case. I hope that there will be a thoughtful judgment. I can't guess uh, what it will be, but I hope it will contribute um, to the historic change that needs to take place, and that is uh, Israelis and Palestinians have to be held accountable for what they do. Until now, it has not been a level playing field, and I hope that that will be the case here. Thanks. That's a great note to end on. I want to thank everyone for attending. Um, you've been so uh, insightful with your questions. Um, I have a comment, a final comment from Rupert Joy. He says, really informative and thoughtful event. And I think that um, echoes what everyone thought as well. So I thought I'd leave that out. Um, Vera Lustig says, excellent event and lots of thank yous for answering questions. So thank you, thank you everyone for attending and being so interactive and, and being um, just on it with the questions. And of course, thank you, Daniel, for joining us and letting us interrogate you <laughs> and uh, because you have such a fascinating mind and 
um, so knowledgeable on this and we're really lucky to be able to um, to hear you speak. Uh, this recording will be going up hopefully by tonight. So um, we'll send out an email probably tomorrow with the links. Um, please do share it, everyone, with anyone that you think might be interested. We want to get the word out as far and wide as possible and, and help educate people on these issues as much as possible. So thank you again and have a lovely rest of the evening. Goodbye, everyone.